Contrary to popular and expert opinion, antidepressants are not a fix-all and they can actually have very serious and deadly ramifications. Today with us is Brooke Seam. She is the author of May Cause Side Effects, a memoir of antidepressant withdrawal. She is going to tell us her story of getting on antidepressants, getting off antidepressants, and what she wishes people, especially parents, knew about the prescribing of antidepressants to children. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. Go to GoodRanchers.com, use code Allie at checkout. That's GoodRanchers.com, code Allie. Brooke, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Um, Could you tell everyone who you are and what you do? Sure, my name is Brooke Seam. And I'm actually a professional chef by trade, but I also do a lot of work in patient advocacy and doctor education for safety prescribing practices of psychiatric drugs. Yeah, I think I first heard your name or saw your name when I read an article by you in the Washington Examiner. It was Mm -hmm. in 2022, so it's a little while ago now. And the title is What I Wish I Had Known Before I Stopped Taking Antidepressants and Before I Started. Uh, You wrote a book called May Cause Side Effects. It's a memoir of antidepressant withdrawal. So I just want to hear about your story. Like, let's go back to what led you to start talking about this. Yeah, I so I was 15 years old and my father suddenly passed away. And this was 2001. So we were in quite a different world, especially, you know, the internet was basically dial up and there just wasn't quite the amount of information we had at the time for, for better or worse, perhaps. But my, my mom took me to a child psychologist a couple of months after my dad died because I was a very stoic kid. I wasn't outwardly grieving and there was just some concern that maybe I needed some help. And so and how old were you? I was 15. 15. Okay. Yeah. And so the child psychologist, she and I didn't really click. It wasn't a good match. And she called my mom up one day and said, you're wasting your money. What your kid needs is a psychiatrist, not a psychologist. Mm-hmm. I'm diagnosing a depressive and anxiety disorder and recommending medication. Mm. And that was pretty much it. I mean, what was my mom supposed to do at that point? Right. She's a widow. She's grieving her husband. It was just the three of us, and now we were down to two. And the only person she ever had to really bounce ideas off of when it came to me was gone. And why should she question the recommendation of a professional? Mm -hmm. So she took me to the child psychiatrist, and I walked out with a prescription for some antidepressant. Uh, We tried a few before we landed on a combination of Effexor XR and Wellbutrin XL, which weren't approved for use in children's and teens in 2001 and still aren't today. But I ended up staying on that combination of drugs. And then about four more were added on over the course of the next couple of years. And I was on that until I was 30 and no one questioned it. Okay. And you said that you were a stoic kid. Before your dad died, you were a stoic kid. I was a very serious ballet dancer. So I was taught to smile through the pain and, you know, you're bleeding into your point shoes. But got to look pretty and make sure that yeah. you don't, you know, you don't offend anyone, right? That's kind of the nature of ballet. So, you know, and I think there was also a level of, of shock as well, mm. because my father died suddenly. It was, and we were out of the country at the time. So it was basically wow. the call that said, you you have to come home. You know, my dad's gone. You and basically. your mom were out yeah. of the country. We were, we were trying to visit family. And so we were in Italy and then had to get home and he was pretty much gone by the time we got back. So you were already a pretty stoic, serious person that had learned to kind of suppress your emotions and reactions in some ways. Mm -hmm. And then when your dad died, obviously you're going to be sad about that. Um, But what led your mom to thinking that you actually need to go to um, a a psychologist? It was a child psychologist. A child psychologist. Why, Why did she think that you needed that? I think it was a combination of things. One is just that I wasn't, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't crying. I wasn't outwardly grieving in a way that 
I don't even know if appropriate is the right word. I think it was just a little weird to people. Um, also, my grades started slipping a little bit. I wasn't going from, you know, getting A's to hanging out in the back alleys and getting F's. It wasn't that bad, but there was a little bit of detachment there. And then also, because I was a serious ballet dancer, I started dropping weight. So I definitely adopted some kind of eating disorder tendencies. And so I think all those things together, my mom just straight up got scared. Yeah. And and she's told me, uh, you know, recently, because we talk about this a lot and we're so close and I don't begrudge any of the decisions she made because I know she was just doing the best she thought she could do at the time. But she said to me, I had just lost one third of my family and I was terrified I was going to lose another third, too. Yeah. So it was, I think, at the end of the day, an act of fear. Yeah. And like you said, it's not like she had someone to bounce these ideas Mm -hmm. off of. She just needed another adult to come alongside her and help with you as she was grieving herself, right? Yeah, she was. And she had other adults, but they were all in the world of psychology and therapy. And so they looked at the situation and basically, basically said the same thing. My clinical expertise says that, yeah, give her some antidepressants. Because again, this was 2001. Prozac had been on the market at that point for 10, 12 years and came on the market in the late 80s. It had recently been approved for use in children and teens. And then Zoloft was also on the market for children and teens at the time. So we were really in the infancy Mm -hmm. of this medication strategy. Yeah. And I was just kind of got wrapped up into it at a time when these things were looked at as completely innocuous. And you said that most of the adults in her life were in the psychology, psychiatry world. Why was that? Well, just the ones she talked to. She went went to a friend of hers who's been a psychologist for 40 years and another friend of hers who had experience So your parents weren't in that field professionally? No, 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 not at all. Okay, that was just kind of who she was getting advice from, which I'm sure she felt like, okay, well, I'm getting advice from the experts, and so (laughs) that's just what I need to do. So you were put on these medications, combination Mm -hmm. of medications, and then you said a few years later you had more added. Why was that? What happened after you were prescribed these medications? So I can can tell you what happened in real time, and then I can also tell you my retrospective uh, knowledge of it. Mm -hmm. But in real time what happened is – I was put on the combination of Effexor and Wellbutrin, and within about a year was having a series of physical side effects. So I was having thyroid issues, I developed something called bile reflex disease, and I was having really bad, you know, acne and female problems and all these things where some of it is just being a teenager. Yeah. Um, And then the rest of it was, well, if your thyroid's not going so well, you go to an endocrinologist and they give you thyroid medication. If you have bile reflux disease, they give you something called sucralfate. So the next thing you know, I just had a series of four more medications that were put on to deal with these other side effects. And no one connected the dots between maybe this has to do with the antidepressants. Never, literally never occurred to anyone. It didn't even occur to me until 15 years later when I hit a point where it was time to get off these drugs for a variety of reasons. I got off everything and none of my symptoms came back for the thyroid problems or the bile reflux disease, Mm. which was baffling to me because I had been under the assumption that these were lifelong chronic illnesses. Yeah. Yeah. And did anyone connect it to, because I know you said that you had some disordered eating. I know with ballet, Mm -hmm. you're made to stay very thin sometimes yeah. that can cause you know thyroid problems, thyroid problems. <laughs> yeah. did anyone connect it to those things yeah. or you know I mean not really and not in a way that would have you know made sense I, I felt like we were looking for zebras when we really should have been looking at horses right yeah. to me it's obvious in retrospect my nutrition was not great so right. yeah and I was grieving still and it was coming out in physical manifestations yeah. and I was under the stress of you know, there was still the pressure to take the SATs and go to college and get a yeah. prom date and all it's these normal a hard things. Time in life. Yeah, it's the worst time anyway. Yeah. So, how did these antidepressants make you feel emotionally? I so I actually have a lot of memory loss too around yeah. this time. Some of it has to do, I think, with the trauma of losing my dad the way yeah. I did. Yeah. And others, uh, antidepressants are known to cause memory problems and cognitive problems. So I think it's the combination. But look, I wasn't thriving before and I wasn't thriving after. Mm -hmm. But what I do know is 15 years later, I was more depressed than I had ever been. 
Yeah. And so clearly they weren't working anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about that. So you were on this medication. You just stayed on the medication just because it's just what you were told you needed to do, right? Yeah. If the doctor tells you, you know, you need insulin, you, you have, because you have diabetes, you don't question it. Yeah. Doctor told me I was depressed, so he told me to take an antidepressant. I didn't so, question that. Why yeah. would I? Right? Yeah. And that was the framework that was kind of programmed into me very early, right at that time when I was forming the foundation of my identity. So I just carried that. And then I carried that, you know, three years later, I'm in charge of my own medical care when I mm -hmm. turned 18. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I had fully just believed that I was this kind of fundamentally broken brain walking around in a body and that I needed this. And there was nothing reflecting back in my life questioning that. Mm -hmm. But by the time I turned 30, I had spent the better part of my 20s in New York City. I was objectively miserable. I was um, really depressed. I was having a lot of suicidal ideation. I had no emotion to anything. Mm. And it just kind of dawned on me that I had spent my entire adult life on powerful psychiatric drugs and that if they were working, I wouldn't be thinking about these things. Mm. And on top of that, it just bothered me that I clearly was so deeply unhappy in my life and I had made the decision that led me to that point through the lens of, of a powerful psychoactive agent. So I kind of started to wonder if I would have made the same decisions had I not been medicated. Hmm. And at the same time, I got an opportunity to travel around the world for a year. And this was, I basically won this weird little lottery and I physically could not take the amount of prescription drugs I had in a suitcase with me and drag it around the world. Wow. And I also would not have been able to get reliable refills mm -hmm. in a lot of the places we were going to since they were kind of, you know, not, wasn't London or Paris. We were right. in other countries. So okay. I didn't trust it. And yeah. so I said, okay, well, I guess I have to get off of these and discover my baseline. Mm. which I thought would be an easy process. All your medications, so not just the, the antidepressants, but all the medications, you wanted to get off of them at the time? I only wanted to get off the antidepressants to begin with and figured everything else was a completely unrelated, you know, chronic issue. Yeah. But then once I started going through, I got off the antidepressants and was in antidepressant withdrawal, there was just kind of something in me that just wondered if... Um, if maybe I didn't need this stuff anymore, if it was all somehow right. connected. So at that point, I was in such hell from having pulled the antidepressants out of my system that I just kind of said, screw it, let's just stop everything else, which, you know, don't recommend that to a friend, perhaps. Definitely talk with your doctor and all those sorts of things. But I just stopped. And as it turned out, none of the symptoms came back for any of the physical ailments. Okay, first sponsor for the day is Carly Jean Los Angeles. I am wearing a Carly Jean Los Angeles top right now and a tank top underneath my Carly Jean Los Angeles top because I wear them all the time. I think this is actually from a couple years ago, but that's the great thing about Carly Jean Los Angeles is that all of their stuff is so classic that you can wear it for years because it's not going to go out of style. That's what I love about them. It really matches my style. I'm a simple gal and all of their stuff is really simple, really beautiful, really adaptable for different occasions, different seasons of the year, different, different seasons of life, pregnancy, postpartum, neither of those things. And I just love their high quality clothes. And I love that they're a company run by a family that loves Jesus, that shares our values. And I genuinely just like how I look in their clothing, which of course is really what matters when you are deciding which clothes to buy. So ditch those clothing companies that don't support our values. Get your clothes instead from Carly Jean Los Angeles. Angeles. You'll be glad that you made that switch. Go to CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com. Use code RELATABLE for 20% off your entire order. CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com. Code RELATABLE. Tell us about what it was like. What did it feel like physically, emotionally to completely stop your antidepressants cold turkey? Okay. Yeah. So let's start with the cold turkey thing. So I, I did what I was supposed to do. I saw a doctor. That's what the commercials say to do. They say, talk to your doctor. So I did. I went and I and I talked to her and I told her what the situation was. And she was really not supportive of it at all. 
And she wanted me to wait for a better time. And I just kind of said, but this is the time. There is no better time. This is what we're dealing with. And so she said, okay, fine. Well, I was on 37.5 milligrams of Effexor XR, which is the lowest dose on the market. So she said, I can't prescribe you a lower dose. Basic, just stop. And good luck. She actually used the word good luck. She said, "Take stop the Effexor first. We'll deal with the Wellbutrin later. And... Again, in retrospect, now knowing what I know and doing all the safety prescribing work, I know that there were other strategies that she could have implored or she could have used, but she didn't, whether or not because she was ignorant or chose not to, I I don't know. Yeah. Again, this was also 2016. We didn't get the first systematic review of antidepressant withdrawal in research until 2015. So this was still kind of fairly new. But she told me I would have the flu for a couple days, maybe. That's kind of what it would feel like. Like flu-like symptoms. Yeah, just, eh, yeah, maybe hot and cold, a little on edge. But and instead, it was what happened to me was far worse than the depression had ever, ever, ever been or anything I had experienced. Mm-hmm. It was a full-on psychological assault of of violent thoughts and images at all hours of the day. Wow. Um, all my senses changed. So I literally started seeing color more vibrantly and things went from a little softer on the edges to super sharp. I developed really severe noise sensitivity. Uh, My skin got something called nodular vasculitis, which is basically an autoimmune response in the blood vessels. And it is because of extreme physical stress on the body. So my taste changed, you know, like literally what I liked and didn't like to eat changed gut issues, uh, huge mood swings that, you know, ranged from rage to actually feeling joy for the first time Mm. in 15 years. And it was all so fickle and precarious and there was no logic to it. And it was so intense. Mm -hmm. And I I literally thought I was going crazy because I had never felt like this in my entire life. And then all of a sudden I stopped taking these drugs. I didn't have the flu Something else was going on, and I thought to myself, Much worse than the flu. Yeah, I thought, I'm. this must be me without the drugs. I must really actually be someone who's really ill. Wow. So you thought, okay, I'm a crazy person, and this pill has basically been helping me maintain my crazy. Yes. And, But um, I was too scared to tell my psychiatrist about it because... I thought that if I told her what I was experiencing, she would put me on an involuntary psychiatric hold. Mm. And there was that out of your mind. What? You felt that out of your mind that you were afraid that that would be the measure that she would take. Yeah. Because here's the thing is that, yes, I was having these awful, awful thoughts and physical experiences and the emotion in my body was just completely off the charts. And often inappropriate, <laughs> like like the reactions would be to something very small. But I was also having these moments of, like I said, color. It was like I could finally see color for the first time. And I could laugh at something and feel true joy. And so there was also this mm. expansion on Gosh. the other side, too. Yeah. And that was so curious to me because I had just I had so believed I was a person who was never, ever, ever going to get better and that. I was just depressed and that was it. Yeah. And so the fact that I was, you know, feeling some joy and some excitement and some curiosity for the Mm. first time as an adult was so attractive to me that I, I just, there was something in me that just did not believe that there was something wrong with that part. And so, you know, in addition to being scared that if I told her about the bad stuff, she would commit me and then I'd end up, you know, drugged up in some awful psychiatric hospital in Manhattan. I just didn't want to give up this little teeny glimmers of beauty I was experiencing. Mm -hmm. And so I I ended up talking to um, a different psychologist friend of mine who was based in another state. So she, she couldn't commit me. And she said, I think that you're having a withdrawal reaction to coming off this drug. And that was enough to convince me that not only was I never going to take these drugs again, but that I was just going to ride it out because I was so mad all of a sudden that I had been robbed of the feeling of joy or curiosity for my entire adult life. That's what I was thinking for 15 Mm -hmm. years. 
it's like I don't know as you're talking I'm thinking of like a metaphor of you are looking through a window and it's been fogged yes. your entire life and everyone's telling you yep. no this is just how it is yep. this is how you can see you can't see any differently and then someone starts like rubbing yeah, away the exactly. fog little by little and you're like wait that's what trees look like that's yeah. what the world is like exactly and you're like someone for 15 years has been fogging this window mm -hmm. and not even allowing me to see what mm -hmm. real light looks like mm -hmm. I mean I imagine you felt robbed yeah that's exactly what I felt like and it's like you just suddenly windex the window yeah and okay but what happens right yes you can see the beauty you can see the trees you can see the flowers you can also see the dirt you can also see the pain yeah. and the light is blinding your eyes right? right so and it was so sudden this was not a gradual thing and it, it, it's so overwhelming to suddenly have all of that input coming into your system and absolutely no tools to deal with it because yeah. you'd spent you know since puberty I'd just been walking around in a state of making Choices based on the path of least resistance because I didn't want to be alive. Mm, yeah. So you came off that drug and mm -hmm. then your doctor who told you to go cold turkey, she yeah. said, we'll deal with the Wellbutrin later. So <laughs> what happened with that? Uh, well, I mean, look, I wasn't a great patient either. So what happened at that point is I had had a follow-up appointment scheduled. To, after, and I, at this point, I had been in withdrawal for a good six weeks probably and I went to my follow-up appointment and somehow we got our wires crossed where you know I thought I was showing up on Tuesday and they had it in for Thursday or something but basically I was in the uh, lobby and she came out of her office and she said you were supposed to be here on Tuesday or whatever and I said well I had it in for my schedule today and I said I just wanted to let you know I'm stopping the Wellbutrin and she just kind of went Okay, and then walked away, and I have never talked to her again. Oh, my goodness. Wow. So then I just stopped the Wellbutrin cold turkey, which, again, probably stupid, but at that point, I don't, I didn't know what I was doing, and I didn't think things could get worse. Yeah. And, and frankly, they didn't. Um, why? I don't know. Uh, there's a theory that different drugs have different half-lives, and, and antidepressants with shorter half-lives typically are more likely to cause more severe symptoms and Wellbutrin had a longer half-life. So the theory is that maybe that's why it didn't affect me as much, but I was also in such dire straits at that point. It was like nowhere, couldn't yeah. go down any further. Okay, it's time to talk about Good Rancher. So they've got this awesome deal still going on in honor of March Madness, and that is... March Meatness, and they are giving you $150 value of chicken wings for whatever subscription that you choose. So when you subscribe to Good Ranchers, you get that box of meat showing up at your front door every month. Makes your life so much easier. Pre-marinated, non-pre-marinated chicken, better than organic chicken, ground beef. That's what we use the most in our home. All different cuts of meat. And then with that, when you subscribe right now with my code, you get that free uh, $150 worth of chicken wings with your order, which is just incredible. If you go to GoToRanchers.com, use code Allie, you'll get $20 off your order, plus, of course, those chicken wings. GoToRanchers.com, code Allie. So how long did that last, the kind of just like undulating emotions? Yeah and extremes that resulted from the withdrawal or the cessation of mm -hmm. the first drug? I was in severe withdrawal for about a year. Wow. And then it was another year wow. before I started to trust that I was coming out of it. So one to two years, depending on your metric. And how did you have the strength to keep enduring <laughs> such intense episodes of emotion especially yeah. after 15 years of basically feeling nothing yeah. I mean it would be hard for the like non-medicated person mm -hmm. to go a full year of feeling that yeah. strongly and trying to remind yourself that you're not crazy yeah but for you going from like stoicism for mm -hmm. almost your whole life basically mm -hmm. in some ways mm -hmm. to that like, what was your narrative inside your head? I, I just imagine that you kept on having to remind yourself, like, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay, this is temporary. Oh, ignorance played a big part. And by that, I mean, 
I did, I was not aware of what I'm aware of now. So right. I didn't have any idea that withdrawal could last for the year that I experienced it. So there was part of me that just kind of thought, well, this is going to get better soon, right? <laughs> and so I think having that a little that kind of dumb approach to it was helpful. And even now I'm really wary when people reach out to me to talk to them about how long these things could last because we don't know. It can spontaneously disappear for people in weeks or months. Other people, I've heard terrible stories of people being in severe protracted withdrawal for years. And so I don't know why one or the other, we don't know anything about that. But for me, not putting a date on it helped me to put one foot in front of the other. I was also just so pissed off that I felt like my only options were to either reinstate the drug or not. And I wasn't going to reinstate because I was so angry. And so that anger fueled me to just say, well, if I have to deal with this for the rest of my life, I guess I will. Yeah. And then finally, and I think that this is, you know, I, I had some really good kind of counseling support and I was able to start working through the emotion and I made a conscious choice not to ascribe the emotion to any one thing. It wasn't about withdrawal. It wasn't about, about the fact that my dad was dead or that I was having a fight with my business partner or whatever. It was just whatever I was feeling in that day. And so I just really tried to dissociate myself from the identity of being a depressed person or someone a, per, like someone in withdrawal or you know, the girl whose dad died, whatever it was, I said, it doesn't matter what that is. I'm just going to address what's coming up today. And I think that really helped me actively deal with the issue as quickly as possible and move on as opposed to staying stuck in the story that I could tell myself. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I imagine that was really hard. And then what was it like when you felt yourself start to kind of even out? Yeah. So there's a term called windows and waves that you hear of in the world of psychiatric drug withdrawal. And it basically means that you have periods of, <laughs> using your window analogy, where the window's really clear and you can see out and you feel calm and the sun is shining. And then there's a period of waves where the window's just completely shut and you are just in a state of huge inner turmoil. And for me, I started to notice that the windows were getting wider. So in the very beginning, in the first few months, I mean, if I even had a literal one second of not thinking about withdrawal, I, that was a one second long window. And then I noticed at one point, oh, God, it's been 10 minutes and I, this hasn't run my life. And so they just started to get incrementally wider until after about a year, then I started to get to a point where it's like, okay, we're having a good week mm -hmm. and then good two weeks and then a good month. And then it just got to be long enough where I said, okay, this is not, it kind of just petered out. It's not part of my life anymore. But And you said your other health symptoms that you yeah. were on medication for, that those resolved after you got Disappeared. Off. Wow. Disappeared. I got a blood test because we were trying to figure out what the, uh, <laughs> all the bumps in my arms and my legs were. And uh, I asked them to run a thyroid panel while we were doing it, and it came back completely normal. Uh -huh. Wow. And I hadn't had any of the GI symptoms either, so it was just like, all right, well. Okay. That's good. <laughs> so, okay, during this time, because you mentioned that you were traveling mm -hmm. for a year. So. Yeah. how What's the timeline? Like, how yes. did that overlap with you withdrawing and you traveling? Okay. So I found out that I had this opportunity to travel in, let's say, early 2016, January, February. I got off the first antidepressant, the effects are in March. And I thought I would have plenty of time before I got on a one-way one uh, flight to Malaysia at the very end of August. I thought I'd have plenty of time to, you know, find my baseline, get on a new drug that I assumed was the answer to all my problems, and we'd be fine. And, of course, that's not what happened. So... I was still in severe withdrawal when I got on that plane and just traveled while this was happening. And uh, for me, I think it was a huge positive because as it turns out, when you completely leave everything in your life and you can't blame your problems on the fact that New York City is expensive or your business partner or your business or the fact that there's, you know, was no men to date and you move from country to country with nothing but a teeny little suitcase 
and you still have problems, well, the only common denominator is you. Mm. <laughs> and so for me, that was ended up being such a gift, as frustrating as it was, because I recognized very early that, like, oh, this is me. I need to deal with this. And mm. it was so clear what the issues were that were being triggered by the outside versus versus ones that weren't because I literally took them with me to an entirely different culture yeah. and country. And I think it very much accelerated my healing. All right. I want to tell you about crowd health. So crowd health is not health insurance. It is another way to cover your health care costs. Health insurance, as you know, it's confusing, it's expensive, it's frustrating, it can actually be detrimental to your health because of all of the stress that it's causing you. You can have health insurance and it feels like you don't have it at all because of how expensive it is. And so you can opt out of that system altogether and you can decide instead to cover your health insurance or your health needs rather with Crowd Health for $175 for an individual or $575 for a family of four or more. You get access to a community of people who are willing to help out in an event of an emergency. So you get access to telemedicine visits, discounted prescriptions, so much more without any doctor's networks getting in the way. Let Crowd Health help with your health care needs. Get started today for $99 a month for your first three months by using code Allie at joincrowdhealth.com. Crowd Health is not insurance. Learn more at joincrowdhealth.com. That's joincrowdhealth.com, code Allie. Tell us about how you were on Chopped <laughs> while you were dealing with all yeah. of this. Yeah, it was a, it was a really like bad week. What had happened was so I'm a professional chef by trade. It's yeah. still what I it's still what I do to make money because you know yeah. most writers aren't rolling in money. Yeah. But uh I had met the casting director of Chopped at a party and like you do in New York. And she said, "Oh, this was in October of 2015. So this was before any of this was on yeah. my radar." And she said, "We're always looking for local female chefs to compete." And I looked at her and I said, "Basically, you don't want me. This is not what I do." Yeah. And and uh, forgot about it, and th they just didn't get back to me for another four or five months. And then what happened was, is I would gotten this opportunity to travel. I had realized I needed to get off the antidepressants, and then I got basically that you're going to be on chopped email all within a very short period of time. And my response to it was, I just had a complete and total. I literally was like on the floor sobbing because it was so much. Yeah. But I uh, decided to do it because I'm just not really one to say no to things. And right. uh, I got lucky that day. I had I was in a window. And so I was able to get through the day. I also got really lucky that the producers took pity on me and didn't cut me into someone who was a complete and total mess because they could have. Mm. I spent a lot of that day crying. I had to be calmed down a lot. I yeah, was, they could have used that. They could have, and they didn't. I'm so glad they didn't. Me too. I don't. I would. I wish I knew who made that choice. I could send them a thank you note because yeah. it really. It was a pretty terrifying thing to, be in such a fragile state on national TV, representing my business, representing myself and my work, and just feeling so vulnerable at the same time. And you, you won, and I <laughs> imagine that was a lot of emotions in that too. Wow. Yeah, and and the thing about winning that day it was actually a huge turning point in my healing because that was we filmed in june about three four three four months after i was in bad withdrawal i hadn't really had an opportunity to have kind of an exhilarating experience yet and that was the first time that not only had the day of filming been so emotionally intense but also because i won there was this huge sense of oh oh, oh my goodness i did it you know, and the rush of endorphins and joy and excitement and pride, again, was so overwhelming in me. And I hadn't felt that yet. So it was just like, it just showed me that I was capable of experiencing this mm -hmm. and that I held on to that for months because wow. I just, I knew deep within me that if I was capable of experiencing that for a couple of minutes, I could repeat it in my life and that mm. it wasn't a one-off and that my brain wasn't broken and I wasn't destined to feel horrible for the rest of my life because I had proven to myself that I had experienced it. 
Yeah. And what have you learned about the industry and about antidepressants (laughs) and especially as they pertain to prescribing children these things since you have now taken this journey? Yeah. Oh, I've learned too much. Um, I think it can best be summed up this way. I'm a professional chef, and yet I spend a lot of my time in universities talking to medical students about safety prescribing practices. Hmm. Why is the chef doing this? Right. Right? Shouldn't this be in the medical textbooks? Shouldn't this be taught to our doctors and prescribers? If you're going to put, if you're going to build a car and you put brakes in the car, you teach people how to slow down and you teach them to accelerate. Why aren't we teaching doctors how to take people off these drugs? Because the bottom line is what I went through and something that was so bad that I had to write a book about it in order to get the word out was avoidable. Mm. And it was avoidable if there was education around safety prescribing practices, if there was true informed consent on the part of not just the patient, but in the case of children, their parents, if people actually knew how flimsy so many of the research studies are, how they're only studied for, you know, what, between four and 12 weeks typically, and yet we have a huge percentage of people in this country who have been on these psychiatric drugs for years, they're, they're operating in a world where we have absolutely no idea what these are doing to their brains and their bodies because the research doesn't exist, and who's going to fund that? Yeah. So you have to know that you're basically part of a gigantic social experiment. Mm -hmm. And if that's the choice you want to make and you're fully informed, then, you know, it's not my place to tell you what to do with your life. But I do think it's my place to call out the fact that we are not fully informing people what's going on. We are not telling them both the pros and cons. And there are serious cons with, with, with these drugs. And then we're not teaching doctors how to take people off of them safely. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people do not know or think about the side effects Mm -hmm. of being on these medications. And it's become so trendy to Mm -hmm. talk about being on depression medication. Um, There was a trend on TikTok being or there was a woman who was calling herself like Alexa Ho Mm -hmm. because she was on Lexapro. Oh, Alexa Ho. And um, this is something on TikTok, the mental health TikTok, Mm -hmm. and kind of glorifying and romanticizing Mm -hmm. having mental health problems, Mm -hmm. taking medications for those things. And if you criticize it, it's Mm -hmm. while you're criticizing this drug that is saving this child's life or this person's life and everything today is now you're depressed you're anxious not ever i'm sad or i'm worried yeah. and that i think is leading to over prescription especially of young people who are already moody and it is normal to be moody as a young <laughs> yes, person but everything becomes a diagnosis yeah and it also really doesn't match up with any of the literature too which further frustrates me i mean people say oh but antidepressants save lives and i say okay well let's look at the literature The FDA did a huge study of over 100,000 people, and they looked at it, and they actually found that in folks under the age of 26, antidepressants increase suicidal instances. Mm. And it's it's, uh, not – basically, there was no difference in the group between the ages of about Mm -hmm. 27 to 65, and it only showed some preventative effect in folks over 65. And that's the FDA. So that statement's kind of false if we want to throw some – research at yeah. it but yeah I, I i i understand the need to belong and i think that what's happening is kids want to belong and this is what they see mm-hmm. i mean i know that for me you know in the mid 2000s it was very trendy to have an eating disorder and that certainly impacted the fact that i developed one Right. Because it was, you know, all over when you had a rail thin Lindsay Lohan, pa- Paris Hilton, and live Diet journal. culture was Diet culture, totally yeah. accepted. I remember in, in <laughs> high school, it was, we did a special K diet where it was literally you just ate special this. K every day. Yeah. I'm sure Big Cereal loved that. 
But yeah. it was like, you know, your ninth, your ninth grade, you're already 115 pounds, yeah. but you think that you need to lose 10 more pounds by only eating special K bars all day. And mm-hmm. that was like, that was totally seen as normal and mm-hmm. a fun thing to do with your friends. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's taken, you know, me 15 years to be like, to look back and say, oh, that probably wasn't like, if nope. my, if my daughters came home and yep. said that they were doing that, I would be absolutely appalled and sad. Yep. But I mean, you're right. People yep. will do all sorts of things, healthy, unhealthy, to feel like they're a part of something and mm-hmm. that they're going to be accepted and praised. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what we're seeing now. And it's just the availability of it is so easy yeah. for kids with TikTok and Instagram and whatever it is. And and, and thing is, I, I'm not a parent, so I don't have any idea how you counter that, but it seems very difficult. Yeah. And... Awareness is the first step, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I I mean, I think as parents, we do have a natural and good propensity to want to protect our kids from bad feelings and bad thoughts. And we don't want our kids to be uncomfortable. We don't want our kids to feel bad. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, and I know that there's a there's a balance here, but having dealt with, you know, bad feelings, feelings of sadness, feelings of happiness, feelings of disappointment, feelings of rejection as a teenager like and learning how to manage those Mm -hmm. and to work through them and to have Mm self-control that even if you feel something really strongly doesn't mean that you act out on a feeling like all of those produce character yeah they produce your personality they produce strength they produce endurance they prepare you for problems in the future (laughs) yes when the stakes are much higher the stakes are low when you live with your parents the stakes Mm -hmm. are much higher when everything depends on you and so robbing kids of that by basically saying, yep. you don't even have any feelings to control mm-hmm. and we're going to take that from you. You are robbing kids of the most formative years of maturation yep. and building character and self-control yep. that they will ever have. Yep. I don't even think we realize what we're taking from kids when we like we just completely clamp down on mm-hmm. that part of their mental faculties, yes. you know? And I, and I can tell you from personal experience that it, it would have been a whole hell of a lot easier to deal with the the grief of my father, specifically in the eating disorder, when I was 15 and 16 yeah. than having to do it at 30 when I also had to, you know, pay bills and manage a business and a whole life and deal with all of this crap that I hadn't dealt with when I was a kid. I mean, I you know, I think we do talk about that we, you know, God only gives us what we can handle, right? And so some people don't like that because they think it's, you know, a cop out or that, you know, people are given different strengths of terribleness. But the bottom line is if something is coming up, it's coming up for you to address it and learn how to deal with it and how to learn how to not make it a pattern. Mm -hmm. And so if a kid is really struggling and, you know, the first line of defense, certainly, in my opinion, just shouldn't ever be medication. But if a kid is struggling, I think we really have to zoom out. We got to look at the parents. We got to look at what's happening in the home, what's happening in the schools. More often than not, when a parent comes to me and says, my kid is struggling, what do I do? I say, get help for yourself. Don't even worry about the kid. You get help for you. You figure out what your role is in this. And I promise the kid will start to work out. The last sponsor for the day is Jace Medical. All right, it's better to be safe than sorry when it comes to the medications that we rely on on a daily basis or the medications that we might rely on, say if we get some kind of infection and we need an antibiotic, Jace Medical ensures that you have a year-long supply of all of those medications that you either take often, take on a daily basis, or that you might need with the supply chain, pharmaceutical companies, the economy, there is just so much going on right now that unfortunately has led to some shortages of some medications. You don't want to be on the wrong end of that. So you can just avoid that kind of catastrophe by going ahead and having a year-long supply stash of these prescriptions that you and your family rely on. It is so much better to be safe than sorry. Go to jacemedical.com. Use code Allie at checkout. That's jacemedical.com, code Allie. And this is not, at least from my perspective, I can't speak for you, always like a 100% anti-therapy 
approach. There mm-hmm. can be healthy forms of therapy. Yep. There can be times mm-hmm. when professional help is needed. I don't want it to seem like I'm indicting all forms of professional help. Yep. But as we said, I do think that the hastiness yep. and prescribing medications and managing inconvenient behaviors mm-hmm. in kids through medication yep. because no one wants to be uncomfortable no one wants their kid to be different no one wants Mm -hmm. to think about the possibility that okay maybe my kid just can't go to like standard public school or private school like maybe this is going to be a little bit harder Mm -hmm. rather than just like suppressing the difficult parts of their emotions I mean you're right there's a lot there that in some ways has more to do with the parents and how we parent than what's going on with the kid yeah and that's not to say that any of this is easy Mm -mm. or that Different people have different stresses that will make it far more difficult for some than others. But yeah, it's not a place of judgment. It's just a reality. It's just a reality. That I think it's yeah. kind of the world that the world that we live in. And you know, as you said, your mom, like she was doing the best that she mm-hmm. knew to do at the time. And yeah. I think that is the vast majority of parents yeah. doing the best that they know how to do. But your point, I think, is like okay, but let's look at everything here yeah they're doing it in a vacuum they're Mm -hmm. not they're 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 not realizing i think just because especially when it's become so normalized you know if all the kids on the block are on adderall or lexapro or whatever it is because lexapro is now approved for use in seven-year-olds um even though six six time the the research (laughs) The study that was used as part of the approval process showed a six-fold increase in suicidal ideation amongst kids, and they still approved it. But, you know. My gosh. So forget that. But that's not being told to the parent, right? Right. Instead, their doctor's just saying, oh, great. Guess what? We have this new one. Yeah. Here you go. And with all the pressure elsewhere. And, and so, you know, I can come across a lot of the times like I'm doctor bashing, and that's not so much of it either. It's just like the doctors are under a huge amount of pressure themselves. They're not getting paid unless something is billed to say, insurance. There's a financial incentive too. Yeah, and it's it's it, some, it's not even an incentive sometimes. It's just how the system works. Mm. And so if the doctor can only get paid if they code, there's no code for we need to get you, you know, there's no code for your dad died or right. you're being bullied at school or your parents you are getting a divorce. insurance coding just yeah. so everyone knows. Insurance coding. Depression, anxiety, yes. something that's cut and dry. Yeah. yeah. They have to have a cut and dry code that the doctor applies for the doctor to get reimbursed. And then there's standard of care. And the standard of care is, well, if you have this particular diagnosis, then you prescribe this particular pill for it. And if you don't, not only are you not against standard of care, which could get you sued, but then you're ostracized in your community. You can't speak out if you're if you're a prescriber. Like it's just it's an absolutely wicked problem. And so y- y- there's there's a thousand fingers to point, but it really doesn't fall on any one organization or person. So it's the it's the whole structure of everything. Mm-hmm. And then parents are kind of almost the most helpless yeah. in this situation. I mean, kids, first of all, but parents also being told, as they're told in a lot of different scenarios today, if you do not do this and listen to mm-hmm. the quote unquote experts, your child will die. Yeah. Your child will commit suicide. Of course the parent is gonna be mm-hmm. like, Okay, yeah. Whatever it takes. Yeah, it's just fear. I mean, your mom said, I was scared of losing yeah. you too. And so if you're told this is what you have to do to save your child, a parent yeah. will do anything to save their child. Yeah. The language is very important in how that is given to people. And that's the language that is used. And it's not the actual data. Yeah. And it's not the flip side of all the children who are fine. Yeah. You know, it's just manipulative. Yeah. And, you know, I, I've done two episodes with Dr. Roger McPhillan, mm-hmm. who is very anti-antidepressants. Yeah. He's very anti-ADHD medication. And I got a lot of feedback after. And yeah, I know it's what a, was that like? It's a sensitive topic. Yeah. And so I understand <laughs> and have sympathy for people who don't like to hear this because they feel like either in their lives or in the lives of someone that they love that an antidepressant saved them from suicide. Mm-hmm. Um themselves or someone else in their life or I know people who have gone through very serious postpartum depression and they were Mm -hmm. put on either like a low dose of an anti-anxiety medication or anti-depressant and they really feel like it helps them and look I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist and so I can't diagnose Mm -hmm. and I can't say 
for sure what someone experienced and why they experienced Mm -hmm. that. And of course, I never want to be negative about someone's positive outcome. Mm -hmm. I'm excited and grateful if you tell me that you were, you know, pulled back from the brink of suicide. Of course, I want to like rejoice in that. Um, But at the same time, I am also fearful of amplifying those kinds of testimonies because of the horrible, awful side effects that so often yeah. happen when people take these yeah. pills thinking that they will be magic. Yes. Just because millions of people swear by them doesn't make them any less dangerous. Yeah. And I mean, millions of people swear by smoking and the same thing, right? I mean, but a cigarette's probably gonna make you feel better yeah. at certain times. And and so the the point is just, I agree with you. It's I don't know why that this is happening specifically in this vertical of medicine you don't hear this with other things right like if you have someone who has a cardiac episode and they're prescribed some drug you don't hear people say well you you can't have a good response to statins because this person didn't like there's it's it's a lot more balanced and again I think it's because we're working in a fear-based place here where people are just terrified of losing a loved one but that's why I'm a full proponent of just true informed consent like the the people who you know effectively give it five stars on yelp let them do it but the people who give it one star on yelp and three stars need to be heard too you can't cut off those voices when it comes to individual health choices yeah and but that's kind of what's happening right right these drugs are very powerful Mm -hmm. and for every one message i've gotten saying this antidepressant saved my life. I've probably gotten five from people since those episodes came out saying either I or my husband or yeah. some or my father became a completely different person yeah. when they were on the or my child became mm-hmm. a completely different person, became more suicidal. Yeah. yeah. After that. Which is consistent with the literature. Which is very consistent. I mean, these are powerful drugs yeah. messing with your mind. And the point is, is that we are so often just like with so many other medications, hormonal birth control, so yeah. many things. We are not told the side effects. We are told, Mm -hmm. trust the experts, trust the science. This will save your life. If you're against it, then you're some kind of hippie kook that thinks that you're better than everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, you just get your information from (laughs) holisticsally.com or something. And so it can be very intimidating. Yeah. Because, but I do think one good thing that has happened in the past few years since COVID is that Mm -hmm. people have started to realize, oh, I can question things. Yeah. I don't have to have white coat syndrome. Like I can, I can ask questions and these are valid questions and these are good questions and I can take charge of my own health Mm -hmm. and I can push back when a doctor says that I have to do X, Y, Z and really ask why. It's a really good litmus test too, because if you push back and they are highly defensive and that's a pretty good sign that maybe it's time to find a new doctor because there are plenty of doctors out there who will say, you know, I need to learn more about this. Let me go learn more about this and then we'll work together. Or there's others who will say, I'm glad you brought me this. Let's again, let's work together. So I think it's great because we have to take a lot more control of our own health now than we ever had to in part because of the sheer amount of information in the system. And so let it let it be your guide let it be your litmus test if something's not feeling right in your body and it's okay to change course it's okay to change doctors and any one decision you made in the past doesn't have to dictate the rest of your health future yeah um how are you dealing now with any mental health challenges that you either feel like you have or even just feelings of being ro- <coughs> sorry <coughs> oh, something got caught in my throat. I'm going to start that question over. <laughs> <laughs> so how are you feeling now? How are you dealing with either any mental health challenges that you might have or any feelings of having been robbed for so long of just mm-hmm. normal emotional experiences? Yeah. I'll start with the first question. Um, As far as how I deal with things now, you know, I actually really use, I guess I'll call mental health stuff. I I think mental health has just been so overused because it's just your whole experience, your emotional awareness. Mm -hmm. 
but I use it. It's a again, it's a litmus test. If I'm having a few a periods where I'm feeling down or where I can feel my body is in a really state of, you know, anx- anxiety or worry, that's a sign for me to look around at what's going on in my life and say, what's off balance here? You know, and it could be as simple as realizing I'm holding my breath when it comes to anxiety and needing to breathe better. It could be, you know, getting off my phone. It could be firing a client. It could be stop hanging out with someone. Right. But it's a sign. It is my little warning light that goes off. And if I address it and I've gained so many tools over the years, then I can usually notice it come really fast and stop it just as quickly. Mm -hmm. And then as far as how I'm dealing with the frustration and anger of basically losing my entire 20s and half my teens, uh, I'm just just obsessive curiosity and learning. I'm trying to do as much as I can with the time I have on Earth. I mean, my father died at 53 and I'm 38. So there's part of me that that kind of messes with my head a little bit because I am like, I don't know. I don't know how much time I have left. If I die when he did, I'm more than halfway through. Yeah. So I'm just trying to do as much as I can and learn as much as I can and enjoy the fact that I finally love that I'm alive. Yeah. Wow. Is there any encouragement that you would give to people who are either considering, okay, taking this dive of getting yeah. off medication or, mm-hmm. I don't know, struggling in the same way that you have? What would you say to them? The first thing is I was I would encourage everyone to do a Google search, do some research on something called hyperbolic tapering. Now, this is At this point, this is what we think is probably the best way for people to taper off these drugs. It's a much slower taper. It doesn't go from 100 to 75 to 50. It it, it follows a much slower curve. And the literature is all out there. And that has been, for the most part, shown to help people step down in a a less aggressive way. And, And there tend to be fewer side effects, not always, but in general. So that's that's something to, for people to take to their doctor. And if we just taught that to medical schools, I think we would have a uh, much better outcome. So that's that's probably the main thing as far yeah. as technique. And then as far as encouragement goes, I think it really this isn't this is a time for you to reach down inside yourself and really listen to that inner voice because if there's something nagging nagging at you, telling you that these drugs aren't right for you, even if everybody else in your life is disagreeing there's something that needs to be uncovered there it's trying to teach you something it's trying to show you something and it's it's time to look at it tell people where they can buy your book and what they can expect yes. so my book is called may cause side effects it uh it won an award for 2023 which is pretty cool that is awesome and uh, you can buy it wherever books are sold the paperback is coming out in april of 2024 awesome there's an audiobook everywhere you can find me all over the internet at brookseem b-r-o-o-k-e-s-i-e-m feel free to send a message say hello i'll send resources when possible but i'm not a doctor i cannot give medical advice yeah you're just talking from your experiences which is yeah. really helpful so thank you so much book i really appreciate you taking the time to come thank on. you thank you so much for having me mm-hmm.